Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. The mark of a person who is in control of consciousness is the ability to focus attention at will, to be oblivious to distractions, to concentrate for as long as it takes to achieve a goal, and not longer. There's a quote from Mihai Csikszentmihalyi the Hungarian-American psychologist who recognized and named the psychological concept of flow, a state of concentration or complete absorption to the task at hand. I thought this quote was appropriate for our returning guest today, John Bertrand A.O., yachtsman, Olympic medalist and world champion, the skipper of Australia 2, which went on to win the 1983 America's Cup, which was voted by the Confederation of Australian Sport as the greatest team performance in 200 years of Australian sport. John is currently chair of the Sport Hall of Fame and was previously the president of Swimming Australia. Hello and welcome to a special episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. I am your host, Greg Robinson, managing partner of Blenheim Partners, the number one research-led executive search and board advisory firm. In this special episode, as we look for leaders to take us beyond the new normal, we welcome John back to share with us a rare glimpse into the world beyond the elastic limitations of the rules. John provides a window into what it takes to deliver on the biggest stage, from the thousands of hours of perfect practice to the mentality and precision required to perform in the heat of the battle. This discussion is not just about individual high performance, but the impact of a true leader in lifting the team, the organization, and the country. So sit back and enjoy the search for perfection. John, welcome back to the show. My pleasure. John, when you look back at your career, when were you performing at your peak? I think uh, when all the homework was done, you know, they talk about 10,000 hours. It's a wonderful concept, and there's a, you know, been books a book and books written about 10,000 hours of practice, but perfect practice, not, not just, you know, shadow boxing, but 10,000 hours of total commitment and more. And when you get into that space where you've done the homework, and then you can play the game at the highest level. And looking back on it, uh, certainly the Olympic Games and the America's Cup, when I've got into an environment where sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, you know, it just flowed and you think, how easy was that? That's the thing, you know, when people come out of a contest or come out of a negotiation or whatever and they say to themselves, how easy was that? In this world of slow motion where seemingly, you know, decisions typically have to be made very, very rapidly, whether you, you are aware of them or not, whether it's a subconscious or not, but it kind of, you know, the, the right decisions are more often made compared to the wrong decisions. and you can take yourself to a higher and higher level. I don't think there's anything, thing, no such thing as perfection. I think that's a misnomer. And that's part of the intrigue of, I think, of high performance as well. Because all one can always improve. <laughs> but then what is high performance? In, in, you know, from a high performer, what is actually high performance? I think it's a consideration of performing when it really counts. You know, when it really counts. At anywhere, at any stage any location at any time around the world at your own volition the ability to actually perform when it really counts so if, if it's in the you know if it's in the cocoon of the olympic games or america's cup or in a you know in a key negotiation in a boardroom or whatever 
It's the ability to perform when it really counts. Yeah. And do I know I'm at that peak? Do I feel it? You said the flow. When does yeah. that, that realisation, is that after the event or during the event? During, where it becomes relatively easy. Now, from my experience, you, you know, people will never get to that point if they haven't done the homework, you know, if the background's not there. Otherwise, you you know, it's, it's, it's bullshit, to be honest. But if you're a student of that subject or that vocation or that art form or whatever, then you can get to a point where, you know, the whole world is so much easier. So, I, you know, I talk in the past about Bradman and Babe Ruth, where they could study the stitching on the ball mm. when the ball would come at them, you know, 100 mile an hour and faster, you know, 150 kilometers an hour or whatever, and, and they could study the stitching on the ball. Well, when you're at that stage, then that ball is coming to them in slow motion. For the punter, you know, for the rank and file, it's just a blur and you get, you know, you get killed in the process. Mm. <laughs> but for these people, they're in control of their environment and then they can hit the ball square on and uh, they walk away and think, you know, I'm in the zone, I'm in that flow zone. So when you're in that flow zone, then you can take your performance to a higher and higher level. And that's the thing, again, you know, I find that, I find that intriguing. And we, we know that also the work we've done with, the, uh, with our swimming program, the Olympic swimming program in this country with the special forces, the commandos and SAS. And they're endeavoring to, to find that, that world as well in collaboration with their, with their mates, with, you know, within, within their groups. And in some cases, they read about, and I've, we've been in the same situation with our America's Cup program, actually, with Australia too, way back in 1983 when we won it, that nothing needs to be said. You're going through complex maneuvers and nothing needs to be said. And people, you know, it's, and they're all in sync. Now, this is really wild stuff. Yeah. But when you're in that situation, it's just, it's remarkable. We, we got the boat out, we meaning the Australia 2 team, Warren Jones and John Longley got the boat out of the, uh, the Western Australian Maritime Museum in 2001 and took it to England for the Centennial Regatta. Right. And we like their 2,000 boats. This is on the, around the Isle of Wight, hosted by the Royal Yacht Club, the oldest yacht club in the world. You know, the black ties, the whole thing, you know, these guys. <laughs> you know, it's an old world stuff. But nevertheless, it's, you know, it's the original how the America's Cup started off. And um, we got the we got the original crew on the boat. So we're talking about like 25 years after we won. We could, and the guys all, you know, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of pride. So people got, you know, these us old guys, we got pretty fit. We didn't want to let each other down. But anyway, we got on the boat ultimately and it was amazing. Hardly anything had to be said. And here we were all these years later, but we're sort of in sync with each other. And we, I could tack the boat. I didn't have to, have to say we're tacking the boat, you know, going from one angle of the breeze to another. And even with the spinnaker going up, very complex manoeuvre, literally nothing was needed to be said. Now, that's a privileged situation to be in. But, you know, we'd spent all those times together. The muscle memory was there. Yeah. Were we at the peak of our game? No way, you know, for goodness sake, you know, compared to the latest America's Cup teams. But we weren't far off it. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's, a, it's wild. What do you think? Do you think high performers are aiming to win the gold or are they aiming to, to be their very best or are they aiming for perfection? Well, I think the concept of winning the gold is clear, but it's not the motivation. And for my, again, from my experience, it's a sort of the following of the dream. And it is the consideration of loving, would you believe, loving the practice and loving the process, loving the journey. I was talking to uh, Kathy Freeman after she won the Olympic gold in Sydney. Like, you know, here's this kid. She was asked to, you know, light the flame of the on the podium. Yeah. The, half the world was watching. The, um, the flame got stuck halfway up. They nearly ran out of natural gas. They got within 14 seconds Is that right? of running out of gas. Yeah, and she had headphones in like this, <laughs> like I've got here. <laughs> And she was saying, what's going on? They said, we just keep smiling. <laughs> you know, the pressure on that kid. 
Fast forward at the end of the Olympic Games, it's the finals of the 400 meter women's That's right. track and field. And she had the weight of the nation on her shoulders. And I said afterwards, you know, what, tell me what was, uh, you know, what's, what was the most memorable part of your career? And she said, the practice. She said, the practice. She loved, she said, in practice, she felt at one with herself and her environment. Now, when we talk about 10,000 hours of practice, in Kathy's world, it would have been 10,000 hours of perfect practice. That's the difference because she loved, she was passionately involved in, the, in what she was doing as a sport. She loved the sport. She loved endeavoring to, to seek and find perfection. And when you get into that space, again, you can take your performance to a higher and higher level. But you'll only do that, not by force, but if you love what you're doing. You know, and I get back to passion. You know, with your own company, building your own company, for example, yep. you know, clearly you love what you're doing. So therefore, you've got a high probability of this thing is going to grow and grow and grow, you know, and you look back and you'll, hopefully you'll be very proud of the results, you know, on reflection. But it's only if you're really into, into what you're doing here. I tell people, if you don't enjoy the work that you're doing, buzz off and do something else because you're only here for three score and 10 or whatever it is. You know, life's too short. Find something where you can become, that you're passionately involved and interested, and then you can become very, very good at your craft as a result. But without the passion, very rare. I might have the passion, but you've got to have that extra, that, I don't know what you call it, which is, wants me to go ahead and look for that edge, doesn't it? You know, yes. If I'm up against Bertrand and have a yacht, I'm going to study you, I'm going to work you out, I'm going to see how you, what your habits are, what your crew yeah. are going to do, everything, aren't I, to know the ins and outs of you as a competitor. That's yep. just more than passion, isn't it? No, it's not. Oh, you don't reckon? No, it, no, it's the drive to to find every. We're not talking. We're not shadow boxing here. We're talking about finding every area of activity to make yourself better. You know, it's this constant drive. In addition, let's say in in the world of sport, you have to have natural ability. Yep. You know, and there's this wonderful man. <laughs> God, I love him, Ron Barassi. <laughs> He sometimes signs his name 17-4-10. He competed in 17 grand finals in Australian rules football as either a coach or as a player and won 10 grand finals. Like, that'll never be. And you scratch, and I, Ron's, of you know, we're close mates over so the last 30 years, longer. And I've never heard Ron say a bad thing about anyone, but you scratch below the surface and he's a mongrel. Yeah. He's a competitive mongrel with so much pride he will literally froth in the mouth if he feels offended you know god bless him you know so he could change the game well barassi you know when you know he's a coach 17 4 10 he's a coach and the uh, one of the the great <laughs> presentations he did supposedly is uh, he said look you know boys uh, uh, natural ability is something you shouldn't be proud of you inherited that through the eye of your father's cock. <laughs> I know, it's pretty rough. And I apologise for that. Actually, I don't. This is brassy. He said, hard work is what it's all about. Spot on. Really? Yeah. But Barassi was also the first to say, only perfect practice makes perfect. That's the differential. So you're going to maximise You're going to maximize every, every opportunity, aren't you? Every second. Yeah. Yeah. Practice is irrelevant in, in a Brassy's mind. Only perfect practice makes perfect. So then we get back to the Kathy Freeman world yep. and we get back into the world of high performance. The great entrepreneurs, invariably, they're students, they, well, they're not invariably, they are students of their domain. You know, even the, the, uh, the Alan Bonds of the world, you know, had a, and Alan's passed on, of course, and, you know, a remarkable individual. And he, as you said, he, they work beyond the elastic limitations of the rules in the roaring 70s and 80s. And, and he's the first to admit the mistakes that were made. But he loved property development. And he was a student of property. And he could make, as he said, you know, most people need 90% of data to make a decision. He, in, in the space of, for example, in property development, would only need 20 or 30% of the information before he'd make a decision. And he didn't see it as high risk. He just thought it was just all part and parcel because he was a student of that, of that world. When I was at the peak in the world of America's Cup, I was a student of that world and I lived it and breathed it. Pretty hard to live with, you know. I, I'm like, 
I make no, um, you know, I, I don't hesitate in saying that. Yeah, but, but it's true. But high performers, I guess, aren't normal, are they? I've, I've never met a, a world champion at the highest level. And I've met a lot of people in my time. I've never met a world champion that's, that's normal. You know, I say to people, you've got to be screwed up in some manner yep. to get out of bed to do extraordinary things, whatever that motivation is, whether it's proving to your mum or your dad that you can do it or your, your extended family or whatever. There's typically, you know, these people that do extraordinary things have a, you might say, a higher level motivation and indeed, in addition to that, love what they're doing. I was listening to Michael Phelps' uh, interview the other day, 23 Olympic gold medals. God forbid. Why? Part of it is he was ostracized from his father. Oh, At right. 12, he, he had never spoke to his father from about 12 years on until he was about 32. And you'd have to say part of his motivation was to proving to the old man that he could do it. Can you pick him, John? No. No, all, all, shapes, all shapes and sizes? All shapes and sizes, yeah. It's hard to know what's inside a person's brain, you know, until you start tracking them. And indeed, invariably, the you know, people who actually achieve really significant things have failed in the past. You know, the venture capitalists, who, particularly in the United States, you know, they, they really, uh, really encourage people to be employed who have both won and, and also failed in their businesses. Invariably, it's pretty common, I think, that you know you need probably two or three failures under your belt before an entrepreneur will really make it big time. Why? It's called experience. You know, you need that scar tissue. You need that element of uh, okay, what's to, to understand the road, the T sections in life. Do you go left or do you go right? It's at key moments, and a lot of cases, mathematical equations or whatever won't tell you. In a lot of cases, it's this gut reaction yeah. based on experience based on experience. And again, the world of special forces operations will tell you that they back their people to the hilt in terms of their ability to, to get the stuff done based on all the work that they've done. And also, also the consideration of not letting their mates down within their squads, you know, the pride within those squads, it's beautiful stuff. So when you go back to yourself, you talk a little bit about Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Why was that such an inspiration for you? Well, if people haven't read it, I really, I really uh, encourage young people in particular to read it. It's about a bird, but it's much more than that. It's about life. It's written by a guy called Richard Bach, remarkable. And um, this bird just doesn't see himself or she. I, I, I don't think they even talked about he or she <laughs> being politically correct. It was written a long time ago. And um, this bird decides he doesn't want to just be part of the flock and scavenge for food. He can see there's so much more interest and fun and enjoyment in the in studying flight, a seagull, okay? So this seagull effectively goes higher and further and faster. And he recruits other seagulls who have perhaps a dream of not just being part of the, the rank and file. Now, when I read it, it, it was really about the search for, for perfection. And this seagull goes through, eventually figures out how to go through the sound barrier with his mates, you know? just goes on and on and presumably they die and they're teaching other seagulls in heaven and you know it's it's a beautiful story but it's really really inspirational stuff and it it's really the difference between making up the numbers and making up the hours compared to going to a higher a higher thought so with that now that's our, you know that a long time ago the australia to Act project where we won the america's cup we beat the americans after 132 years of competition the longest running sporting event in modern history and where Australia was the first to beat the United States of America. It started off before the US Civil War. The Confederation of Australian Sport voted the Australia 2 victory as the greatest team performance in the last 200 years of Australian sport. So, you know, there's something going on with that. It was, you know, it had an X factor, clearly. And uh, with that project, it was a little bit like higher, further and faster, where when wherever we were sailing, and we're in full practice mode, not cruise mode, but full practice mode. We endeavored to sail like Jonathan Livingston Seagull, where we would just endeavor to stretch and push the envelope further and further. And that last race of the America's Cup, 
where they called the race of the century. And we, were, we came from 3-1 down to 3-2 to 3-3, and eventually the final race. And the race, the, the race changed, the leadership changed every, uh, maybe four, five, five times maybe, I think it was. And when we passed the Americans, the red boaters, we never talked about Dennis Conn or any of that, we just talked, we dehumanised the whole thing. When we passed the red boat, I reckon, Greg, we were as close to perfection as we'd ever been in sailing that boat. Did you feel it at the time? Yeah. And it was slow motion. And the boys were in, in total sync, where again, nothing was being said. And here we were, potentially going to create history. We're still behind. But we, we got back in the race and we caught every wind shift as close to perfection as you perhaps could imagine, as we could imagine. We looked at the track, the, the XY plot after the racing at one of our reunions, actually. And it was pretty impressive how we sailed that boat. Under extreme pressure, the second last leg of the course in September 1983. So I think Jonathan Livingston would have been proud of us at that, on that day. When did you make your mind up that you were going to be a Jonathan Livingston? Oh, was it as a kid, day? I was a, yeah. a dreamer. <laughs> yeah, really. You know, did the, someone give you the book? How did it all begin? Oh, I see. I had. I come across. I don't know how I came across it. But it just, it, obviously, it some, someone obviously someone thought something about you, or you you picked it up, or something like that. You must have been. You must have been thinking about. I've got to make something of myself here. No, not not the end game of winning the America's Cup or winning Olympic gold medal or making something of myself. Okay. No. It was it was just just the opposite. Again, the journey. Uh -huh. that I just loved the concept. I loved looking at the flight of birds, for example. Mm -hmm. I reckon I came across Jonathan Livingston Seagull because he dropped it out of the heavens, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> it just kind of came in a, a bolt of lightning. <laughs> no, no. But um, you know, I've I've always been as a kid fascinated with the concept of wind and water and and when I came across Benny Lexon, the designer of the Australia too, you know, he, a remarkable man, he, as I've said before, he was, in my opinion, the Leonardo da Vinci of this country. Is that right? Yeah. And he went to school at nine and left at 12 and three years of education, which is nothing, obviously, but he was never taught to think inside a box. And he would study the flight of birds. And he'd, as he's pointed out one time down at, outside of Sydney, when I joined him after the the 72 Olympics, and I just graduated from MIT in Boston in a uh, Master of Science uh, course that I did over there, which he was telling me about seagulls and the response of their feathers with the turbulent flow going over their feathers when they're taking off and, and landing. Mm -hmm. And as I've said, you know, as he said, you never see them crash land or a crash takeoff. It's just per perfection. Their little brain is smaller than a pea. But as he said, they'd have to be a thousand neuron nerves connecting every feather to that tiny little brain. And that flight control system, yep. this is through Benny's eyes of three years of formal education. Like, what a joke. <laughs> three years of formal education. And Benny's telling me that the flight control system of that seagull, and we were looking at a flock of seagulls then, was more advanced than any military jet airplane known to mankind. He was thinking okay. like that, was he? Yeah. How cool is that, eh? Unbelievable. So here's Benny, and, and, and I still, and I'm a, I'm a mature-aged gentleman now, <laughs> and when I'm down the beach with my darling Raza, my wife, you know, a seagull flies past, I'm fascinated, and I'm still looking for the feathers, the way they're articulating in the wind, such that when they come into a land, they just stall the air, turbulent flow goes from laminar to turbulent, drop onto the Earth's surface, perfection every time. We're a long way off from that. Why is it only limited to so few? Yeah, it's a good point. I, I think lack of curiosity, I think. You know, the, people suggest that the majority of people stop asking questions when they're 13, 14, 15 years old, when they're growing up. You know, a little kid full of questions. It's a beautiful thing. You know, we've got grandkids six of them now and the youngest is five and she's just full of questions and full of observations 
Now, hopefully, she'll be full of questions and observations when she's a, uh, a grandmother, okay? But most people aren't. They kind of slow down in the, in the world of curiosity, and there's so much to learn. You know, we, we know so little about the, the rest of the world or the, the, way the, you know, the way Einstein looked at the world. So I think when you say, why are there so few? I th my observation is not many people are really curious. Again, asking and learning as a result. So when we're talking about people higher, further and faster, yeah, it's a unique group of people. There's no question about it. There's also, if you're going in, say, the, the sporting analogy, John, higher, further, faster often means sacrifice and enduring pain. Yep. Okay. What's that take? Well, you know, cause uh, going back to yeah. that point, why, you know, why aren't every, why isn't everybody else up to that? Why are they accepting all that pain, that sacrifice and that standard? Well, very few, again, few people will accept that the standards we're talking about, both physically and mentally. When we're talking about the physical area, well, not necessarily mentally in terms of strain on marriages. Yeah. Okay. Strain on relationships to the, detriment of people around you yep. you know it's a reality you know when you're doing extreme stuff uh there you know there's compromises in life no question about that we see that all the time so you know my marriage to raza the only reason that we're still married is because she, she's hung in there you know she, as i tell people she only left me three times <laughs> <laughs> but i found her each time <laughs> And one of the beautiful things she did, Greg, and this is you know, a very smart woman, she left me with a kid each time. So I was buggered. Uh -huh. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> oh, I say that in jest, but uh, God bless her. But the point is that she hung in there. And, that, and she's a very special person to not be, uh, you might say, indoctrinated by her friends to say, leave that crazy guy yep. and go and get a normal life. You know, with a picket fence and you know, a nine to five job. So again, that's a, that from my perspective, that was the luck of the dice, roll of the dice. You know, to, that we married when we were young, we grew up together, and we're still growing together, and we've been married for over fifty-one years. And so, within the world of the America's Cup, that's a world record. Most most of these marriages implode into a million pieces after ten years because yeah, right. it's all too much. Um, so there's fallout everywhere, and I'm not saying that you know to create something really great you know is it a is it something you recommend to everyone it, you can't say that because again there's compromises everywhere however you're here for three score and ten you look back and you think well what's the imprint on life that you mm. want to lead yep. certainly from my perspective and for a lot of people and particularly young people who have no fear the concept of a nine to five for ever more white picket fence is not necessarily compelling I'm not sure that helps people, but nevertheless. No, but I, I, I can see yeah. many who don't have a full appreciation or see it from a different side that those who are pursuing perfection get sometimes classified as selfish. Yeah. But you've got to be in some regards too, don't you? It's all consuming. It is. And one interesting thing is, you know, we look at the, in the swimmers, you know, I've just done my seven years as president of Swimming Australia, which was a, you know, a real honor to be involved. And, and, you know, you look at the Grant Hackett's and the and the Thorpeys and you know our, and Susie O'Neill's, our great swimmers. Invariably, at the very top of their game, that was to the exclusion of pretty much everything else, social life and everything. And they struggled more than a normal retired swimmer because they didn't know what to do beyond that life, to the exclusion of everything else. So you're talking about. Yeah, you know, you're compromising, no question, it really is. But we do know also, I must say, that 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, our coaches were all about, you had in the swimming world, you had to be fully committed if you're in the Australian swim team, part of the Dolphins team, 100% committed, uh, fully committed seven days a week. We now know that if they have outside interests, they'll perform better. We know that. And in the world of AFL football, yeah. which is a highly professional, highly developed sport in this country, they know that a player where they're spending, you know, these guys are earning half a million, maybe a million a year now. It's, it's, it's really professional and, it's, and, 
and terrific. I, you know, I think it's wonderful. Those individuals who have outside interests perform better. Now, in our swimmers, probably 70, even 80% of all of our dolphins now are pursuing tertiary education, whereas 10 years ago, it would be 30%. Big change. Okay. Okay, so there's a balance in life. Yeah, right. So it's not the commitment that you know people talk about. But regardless of that, it's still whenever the switch is on in terms of full on absorption of that uh, of the craft that you're involved with, then it is to the exclusion of everything else whilst you're in that training mode and indeed competition mode. We're talking about human performance here. Yeah. Pushing the envelope. That's what we're talking about, I think, at least. Yeah, and look, and as we I guess, John, we decided to do this together because, you know, we're finishing up, hopefully coming out of COVID in the near future, and we want this country to step up to the opportunity that it presents. Yeah. How do we encourage people to actually seriously think about, stop reading those books and get realistic and cut through this? You now, there's a lot of talk out there about high performance, mm. but don't you think a lot of it, it's way over the top and there's all these lectures and these theories? It's hard yards, isn't it? It's sacrifice. It's being smart as well. It's all those things, no question. And there's a lot of a lot of literature and so on, on it, and, they're, and they're words. They're only words. It gets back again to the fundamental aspect of find something that you love doing, You're right? And then giving it a crack, okay? And giving it a crack both physically and mentally, preparing yourself. Phelps trained seven days a week when he decided that he wanted to become a world champion. Now that you know, do you recommend that to your kids? No, no. It's you know got to be crazy 23 olympic gold medals struggled each time after each olympics pretty much hit depression each time is that right 2008 2000 and yep 2000 he didn't win anything i think it was fifth and he basically went in decline 2004 after that depression 2008 2012 london huge commitment and sacrifice luckily he met a woman who grew with him and they, they came and went, and that's his current, I think, wife, but certainly the mother of his, uh, of his child. And he, from what I can see, he's in, a, he's in a content, happy space now. But he grew through that whole period, trying to prove, presumably, to his father that he could do it. So and that's what, not a normal person, is no, it? No. However, look what he achieved, for goodness sake. Yep. Probably the greatest ath Olympic athlete this world's ever seen. So what do we know about the mind, John? Not much, I think. You know, the, the mind, the brain burns up from what I understand about 20% of the body's energy. It weighs about one and a half kilograms, a small percentage of your overall weight. And there's so little known about it. You know, we, you've got the, the conscious and the subconscious part. And from what I can see, it's programming, particularly the subconscious part, not programming, but really endeavoring to understand the two sides of your brain. But I, I noticed... Well, you know, again, the school of hard knocks. I did the 72 Olympics, uh, won the leather medal, worse than last, terrible. Mum and the kids care about it, otherwise nobody cares at all. All that work, you think, my God. Anyway, I went You're a bit back. tough on yourself there, John. It's still not a bad yeah, effort. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but it depends what you're in the game for. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, married to Raza, you know, newly married. Starry-eyed, bushy-tailed, went for the 72, 72 Olympics, then 76 Olympics after the 74 America's Cup with Alan Bond and, and Benny, you know. But 76 Olympics, won the Olympic bronze, figured out probably three or four months after that Olympics in Canada that I could have won the Olympic gold just as easily. The difference was mental toughness, not the physical preparation. I'd done my 10,000 hours of endeavouring to, you know, seek perfection, as did the other athletes at that Olympics at the top, probably 10 of the uh, of the different nations, one competitor per nation in, this, in the world of yacht racing and the fin class, in single-handed fin class, which is what I was competing in. Probably 10 could have won the Olympic gold in that, at that regatta. The difference was mental toughness and the ability to make the right decisions at the right time, to have a level of calmness, now, all those worlds, when I looked at the East German who won and the Russian who was second and I was third in that Olympics, that was before the AIS was set up instantly. You know, we had no coaching, no money, no nothing. But, you know, so I'm very proud of that, that bronze. But the difference was not the physical application. 
of racing a sailboat at the highest level. It was the mental ability to make the right decisions at the right time or not. I mean, I'm talking about, again, high performance, the differentiator here. And the ability, and I, and I noted, one thing I noted when I was observing the East Germans, we never, they never came out of hardly ever raced this, this particular guy, guy called Jochen Schumann. He went on to win two Olympic gold medals in subsequent Olympic Games after, after the, uh, the 76 Olympics, both 80 and then 88. And uh, he was calm. And he had these grey-coated people around him, and some of them were what we now call sports psychologists. Okay. And when I started to observe that, it became clear to me, having known to have gone through the heat of battle with those Olympics and looking around and making a mistake, you know, if only, the whole world of if only, it became clear to me that the difference at that level then became a, a game of minds, how you both the conscious and subconscious can make the right decisions at the right time in the world of slow motion so that we get this beautiful, beautiful feel of, you know, how easy is this? But how do you get to that point, John? What's, what does it take to get to this point where you cool, calm and collected, as you say, under extreme pressure or adversity? Well, the military talk about down-regulating. What does that mean? It means that you're on the starting blocks of the Olympic Games and this year, hopefully, in Tokyo. Okay, the Australian swim team, the swim member, he's in here, he, she is in the finals, or are lining up for the first race of the America's Cup. Okay, you know, when I was doing my thing. The question is having a state of mind so that you're calm. Now, in that environment, in a lot of cases, your heart can be racing, your breathing's racing, your adrenaline is racing. Okay. And in, uh, not hyperventilating because you're, you know, you're pretty good at what you're doing. But the question is, how do you pull yourself back so that you get a state of calmness? Now, it's not the calmness that, you know, the the uh, the punter in the street is talking about calmness. We're talking about calmness at a level where you're on the world stage and all your life is in front of you. Yeah. It, all the work you've done is behind you, and, and your whole life is in front of you. So the the stakes are high. So the question is, how do you get there? Well, you, you know, this concept of resonant breathing, slow, deep breathing, the ability to reflect back on the support of your team and your coaching and your support staff, the concept of not the pride in what you've been doing and the passion. These are the, these are the mental gyrations you're going through. And the ability to st literally step back from the picture that you're in, and this is the way I I saw life and take control of your own environment instead of the environment taking control of you. So you go into the board meeting, you go into a presentation where you've got to raise extra amount of money and your whole company is on the line. You don't even have enough money next week to pay the wages of your staff. Okay. You're on the line. How do you present yourself in a cool manner so that you, when the decision, when the questions come at you and the decisions are made that you not only you, you, hit, you hit the button each time and you give confidence to the people who are potentially going to say yes or no in lending a whole bunch of money to continue with that company. Or with the America's Cup, the boats coming at you, these new America's Cup boats are now sailing at close to 100 kilometres an hour. Wow. The approach speed in some cases could be 200 kilometres an hour. How do you make the right decisions at the right time, split second, and it's calm and you are in slow motion? so that you're in that flow zone. So that's really reflecting back on all the work you've done, taking the deep resonant breathing and saying, how cool is this? I wouldn't be dead for quids. This is a chance of an opportunity. How beautiful a moment is this? Let's get on with the game. Instead of, oh my God, we're gonna die or oh my God, the consequences of winning or losing. The other element is the consequences of winning or losing is like cancer or can be, okay. and to get that out of your mind. So when we talk about a winning Olympic gold medal, winning the America's Cup, closing the deal for a new round of funding, you know what? It's, it's, it's the final game. There's no question about it. But the, the reality is, it's, again, it's this whole loving that environment, loving that process, loving the, the heat of battle, loving the smell of gunpowder and bringing it, bringing it on instead of it just being all, all encompassing and all... Um, you know, that just envelops you such that you can't, you, your mind goes cloudy. 
Where does ego fit in? Where does arrogance step out? I think ego is a very, very important part of human endeavour. The question is controlling it, but I think it's very, very important. In Australia, if you seem to have too much ego, it's called tall poppy syndrome. They'll belt the hell out of you. Okay. In America, you can have ego, and that's all part and parcel of living in the world of high fives. Okay. In the United States, young people in America, you know, and Rouse and I lived in the US for probably seven years over different periods of time. You know, we noticed that young people at schools, they're, they're encouraged to ask a lot of questions. Our kids at school in this country, not so much. We don't put ourselves out to the same degree. But ego is, I think, a very, very unhealthy part of a, of a character. And again, without ego, then you've just, again, I don't think that people can get out of bed to do terrific things, let alone extraordinary things each day. When you roll it back all these years, John, when you're in the quest to win the America's Cup in the preparation or during the event. Can you maybe give us or share some insight to not actually the extreme, but the stuff you guys did to get the edge? What did you do, which is not normal? Well, the basic vision of the project was, I think, uh, extremely important, you know, and, and teams need a vision, organizations, people, families need a vision, countries need a vision. You know, it's just a reality. And we need this thing called trust. That's the glue of any organization, particularly a high performance organization where you're putting under extreme pressure. The vision effectively was pretty simple. What will this game look like in 20 years time out there? Okay. And from my world, I'd looked at the Olympic games. You know, you look at the performance in any four year Olympic cycle and you see an improvement in performance track and field, throwing a javelin, running 100 metres or swimming a 100 metre a race, freestyle race. You take any 20-year period of the Olympic movement and you have a quantum leap in performance in every discipline. That's the interesting thing. Now, the body, the human body, doesn't change in 20 years. You need 200 years to change. So putting us aside why is it so, all we do know is, is that the world of running an IT company from Australia – okay, yeah. to the world, the sophistication of that in 20 years' time will be much further advanced than what it is now. The consideration of racing in the world of America's Cup in 20 years' time will make these current boats look like a joke. We look at our look at the Australia 2 effort and we're way ahead of, the, of our time, as McKinsey said you know, when they studied it, the Australia 2 America's Cup project, we're on a new S-curve of development. Okay, really, you know, interesting way of looking at it, and it was true. Twenty years on, however, those projects were much further advanced than the Australia Tour effort. Yeah. So the basic vision of the project was very simple. All we've got to do is emulate what we think our beautiful young kids will achieve in twenty years' time, and apply that to now. And so we said the conclusion was the competition wasn't the United States of America or the other nations that we had to defeat to get to, to effectively take on the United States, which were the Brits and the French and the Italians and so on, Canadians. The competition was ourselves in our inability or not to take our own blinkers off. And if we could take the blinkers off, think out of the, out of the box, as a result, empower our people around us, we potentially could become so good that even with the worst luck, we'd still be successful because we're playing the game in 20 years' time instead of compared to here and now. And the world here was very much a development project. You know, the America's Cup is like Formula One motor racing or any technology oriented business, not smokestack, but a technology oriented business. Yeah. And in that world, it's a question is, okay, having a group of people who have license to think beyond what is the here and now and what the game will look like. You know, we look at the banks now. Yeah. National Australia Bank announced that they want to be able to approve a home loan within 60 minutes instead of two weeks. Yeah. Well, I would suggest that in 10 years' time, it could be a matter of minutes, not an hour. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> Even though an hour is, you know, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And that's just the reality of human endeavour. So for, for us, and to excite young people, what the game could look like in 20 years' time and apply that thinking to now. So even if we could get 10% of what that was going to be, we would blow the competition out of the water. So that was a fundamentally important thing, you know, aspect for us. And the other aspect is in holding the team together, 
was this thing called trust. You know, people talk about trust all the time, but my golly, what is trust? And from mm. my perspective, it's it's about um, it's about honesty, it's about integrity, basically uh, being clear in what you say. You know, the clarity of communication. Talk about clarity of communication. Leadership is all about ability to communicate. Bob Hawke was one of the best. John Howard, in his own way, was Ronald Reagan, one of the best. No question. And with that world of, of uh, trust, then you get in the world of where you can, you know, potentially get one plus one equals three. If you have a vision that's exciting and you have a, a world of trust within your organization where you get that supposedly one plus one equals three, where everyone's feeding off each other, then you can take it to another level of, of performance. And uh, so very few people and organizations get to that level, I must say, particularly large organizations. It's hard. Just on that, Warren, in this point, who made the approach to you to be Skipper? Alan Bond. Okay. So he trusted you? Yeah. Okay. So how did you frame your story to get those to come and join you? And when, what was your pitch? Was it that we are going to be thinking 20 years ahead? As you say, you've got to be clear in the purpose. What was it at the time? Well, it was uh, whatever makes the boat go faster. It's a very interesting, these latest America's Cup projects, the, the British project is a 250 million Australian dollar program. 250 okay. million? 250 mil. We won the America's Cup on probably about three and a half to four and a half mil, long time ago. Okay. Yeah. So again, we're talking about beyond 20 years out. We're now talking about 40 years out. Yeah. Okay. New world, highly sophisticated. Talking to uh, one of the key technical people the other day with, within the British effort, he said one of the biggest challenges they have is they have so many resources, including Mercedes-Benz, F1 team behind them or the research people behind them, yep. that they can go down too many rabbit holes. Uh, okay, They've got yep. too much availability. The only thing they can't buy is time. They've got to front up. Okay, So this whole issue of you know the focus and being able to execute keeping it simple and revolving around this thing where you're in this together, no fear mm -hmm. of, of failure. Young people have very little fear relative to older people. All of those things are an important part of, you know, creating something that's very special beyond an individual to an organization. Yeah. How do you go about team selection? Well, first of all, natural talent. Okay. Back mm -hmm. to Barassi, God bless him. Mm -hmm. But then beyond that, these people had to be very much at the top of their game within within the country. And in addition to that, the ability to integrate as an organization. So for example, we meaning the team, we stayed with each other at the customs house over at Williamstown outside of Melbourne for effectively three months to test our compatibility because we're off to war, off to the United States of America. The Americans, beautiful people, hell fellow, well met but they'll kill you in the process if they can, you know, you know, you know, with it metaphorically and uh, although maybe not, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. So what we had learned, and that was my fourth America's cup effort and Alan Bond's fourth as well. And some of our key people, including John Longley and, and uh, Skip Lissaman keep, you know, absolutely key parts of the program. What we did know is compatibility was vital because when the chips are down, that's when the strength of the organization will come through if indeed you have a strong organization. So when we were 3-1 down, there was no one booking airfares to go home, which is a pretty interesting litmus test. And Warren Jones, our manager, uh, you know, reflected on that after we won. Typically when you, you know, at 3-1 down, the probability of coming back is probably a thousand to one because the Americans were very formidable. Yeah. No one was booking, none of the loved ones were booking airfares to go home. It was all about the focus of the project, you know, how we can take this thing forward. All you focus in on, on today and tomorrow, nothing more, nothing beyond that. So the compatibility of the team was vital. Compatibility of the individuals as the way we work with each other was vital, as well as natural ability and also the 10,000 hours plus of, of endeavoring to achieve perfect practice. Okay, but perfect practice doesn't happen all the time. Things go no. wrong in training, right? Issues yep. happen. People blow up. It gets upsetting, gets frustrating. You're the skipper. You're the leader. How do you manage high-performing people from a leader's point of view where you've got to stand above the rest? 
again, it's getting back to Jonathan Livingston Seagull. You know, you've got to be a bit crazy. You know, here's Jonathan doing his thing. He doesn't care about things blowing up. He's just up in the air endeavouring to break the sound barrier. And, you know, you look at the sectional shape of a, of a seagull's wing, they're not designed to break the sound barrier. You know, the right stuff, they, you lost control because the wings were Chuck Yeager. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it's the, 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 the leader's role, in my opinion, particularly doing something that had never been done before, you know, mm. this Everest of sport had never been conquered, yep. was to keep in the higher level of the dream. Okay, what's this game all about? How is this game going to look like in 20 years' time, boys? Let's get there faster than anyone else in the world. It's pretty zany stuff, but it's the vision of a leader. And then having that transparency of communication that uh, that honesty that integrity such that you you know that you have total trust in the organization and you know what in addition to having fun so important yep. so important to have jokers in your organization robbie brown was a joker mm -hmm. he was such an important part within our team and and he as a result you know when things got too tense through robbie we all started to laugh at laugh at each other you know it's beautiful Again, that synergy, the people talk about synergy, it's true, where people just really enjoy, really love working with each other so that you're literally now in the world of not only nine to five, but seven by 24. It's a different world of, of application. John, what do you reckon your teammates as superstars in their own right or you know, best of the best and high performers, what do you think they are looking for from a leader? So when they signed up with you, and out goes this new, new boat, and Mr. Lexon's designed this new keel, you guys are trialling it and everything else, and off you go. What would, you know, quietly on the boat or after hours, what are, what are they watching? What are they looking from you as a leader? I think a sense of inspiration and I think a, and a sense of, of a positive nature, you know, the glass half full, no question about that, you know. Um, how real is that? Well, it's up for other people to, to figure that out. But this, this concept of, uh, hey, we can all not only can do better, but we will do better, a potentially a roadmap forward of how we're going to do better. Uh, the ability to attract and continue to attract and retain world-class people. It, within the world of the uh, New Zealand All Blacks, no dickheads. Yeah. How true is that? Yeah. You know? And the definition of a dickhead? Well, not fitting in, not being able to contribute, you know, being out of sync with the organization and particularly where that organization is going as a unit, as a, as a team, uh, lack of compatibility and so on. A leader has to lead, there's no question, has to show vulnerability. Big breakthrough recently, I think, within a AFL football, some of these coaches are now showing their vulnerability. Again, I reflect on AFL footy because it's pretty advanced within Australia, within this, you know, within, within this country, in terms of sophisticated way of getting stuff done. And these coaches now showing and demonstrating to their, to their team members, to their players, that they need help as well, you know, that we're all in this thing together. Uh, I, I, uh, I was able to get Laurie Hayden, a sports psychologist, into the team with the Australia 2 project as a result of uh, Carlton Footy Club at that stage being the premiers way back in 1982. And I approached the captain then, uh, a guy called Michael Fitzpatrick, oh, yeah. who's a Rhodes Scholar. Rhodes Scholar, absolutely. Yep. yep, interesting. Became commissioner of the AFL, highly successful, director of um, Rio Tinto, a good friend. We became good mates. He directed me to their sports psychologist, a guy called Laurie Hayden. And uh, Laurie became a very, very important sounding board for me, a professional sounding board. Not only on how I could get more out of myself, but how I should, could potentially react to different situations uh, in terms of how I interrelated with my team members. Again, having endeavoring to get world-class support around you and not feeling that you have all the answers because nobody does. So I think a leader shows, my opinion is, shows vulnerability that empowers the people around that person, that so-called leader. Not very conventional thinking at the time. This is supposed to be pretty macho type sport, men are men, and you're bringing uh, a uh, sports psychologist on what, in 1983? Yeah, a long time ago. So how was well, that only, seen by the fellas? Well, first of all, only because the 76 Olympics, I, I figured I could have won the gold just as easily if I had been mentally tougher. That was the turning point. Without that so-called loss, there's no question I wouldn't have 
being able to perform to the same level and make more right decisions than wrong when it really mattered, you know, in terms of high performance. How was that interplayed within the team? Well, interestingly enough, in the very early days, sports psychologists, head shrinks. That's right. They were called then head shrinks. <laughs> yeah. You know, Bondi, when he had found out that I wanted, uh, you know, I brought uh, Laurie in, he said, well, perhaps he's made the wrong decision <laughs> if, Bertrand, if Bertrand needs a head shrink. And that's pretty logical thinking, you have to say, in that era, you know, what the hell's going on? So he was misunderstood. Laurie was misunderstood by some of the teams, including, you know, people like Alan. And, and why, in some cases, some of the team members, in my opinion, is didn't want to show up their own vulnerabilities. Oh, right. So they, they had lack of confidence in their own inner self, which was fine. Uh, some of the others thought it was just great and they just needed to know more and more about themselves. So it was interesting on who took up that, uh, that asset, that asset of knowledge or not. From my perspective, it was a wonderful, a wonderful resource for me. And again, it's, again, it's getting the help of everything between the ears, you know, as getting back to the point of performing when it really counts on the world stage. How do you do it? Well, all I do know is in 20 years' time, this conversation will be much more sophisticated than it is now. The world of the Australian Institute of Sport, AIS, where it'll be in 20 years' time, will be much further progressed. The world of special forces, the way they operate, the way they inter interrelate with each other, one would assume will be much further developed and uh, much more sophisticated. Where does failure come into the whole play? I don't think it does. It's kind of interesting. Uh, failure... Look, you know, it's a bit zany, I know, but you're talking about you're talking to a zany person here. But failures for me is about learning and moving on. <laughs> so that's the glass half full thing. Now, okay. okay, you can run out of money. That's failure. You go broke. It's failure. There's no question. But it's not the end of the world. Okay, you haven't died. Maybe in some circumstances you do die. That's not good. But with, <laughs> within the world of sport or world of business, it's about a learning. We're talking about a journey here. That's the way I see. So failure is all about picking up the lessons. And the Americans are very good at this. You know, venture capitalists, a company that I, that I launched in the US with a, uh, my business partner, Alan Rabinan, a company called Crocker Sports. Mm -hmm. We had venture capitalists on our board. And they were very, very keen for us to employ people who had so-called failed in the past. They had lead companies that had gone there bankrupt on the basis that that's called experience amongst the world of, of Silicon Valley. Yeah. And it's not only a combination of, of you know, knowledge, but it's also companies all based around the you know, people who have experience. The question is the fear of failure is a big one. And I think that's a much more important situation. Fear of failure holds people back. But the concept of failure, from my perspective, doesn't really worry me that much. So what's the mental condition when you're losing in the America's Cup at that time? We just keep plugging away until they tell us to go home. <laughs> so the, the thought... Doubt doesn't come in at all? No, well, doubt, it's irrelevant. So the idea here, it's kind of interesting when I look back on it, is, is that when we're 3-1 down, the probability of winning from there is, was very, very low, Okay. But the focus was to get rid of the consequences of winning or losing out of our, out of our minds because it was like cancer. It was, had, it was irrelevant to the cause. Okay. The consequences of winning and becoming a national hero back in your own country, Australia, was, could be all-consuming. The consequences of losing and never wanting to go back home because you were, you were so embarrassed about what you'd done, again, was equally all-consuming. It had no relevance to the actual issue of getting on with the job at hand. We went actually 0-0, zero, zero, then 1-0, 2-1. Anyway, we got the 3-1. And so we made plenty of failures. That's the point. We made the mistakes, a whole bunch of mistakes to get the 3-1. And how did I think about it and the key people in the team? A learning experience, pretty zany stuff. Not that we'd lost. We just keep going. Well, you know, I remember talking to the guys. I said, you know, guys, all we've got to do is for tomorrow's race, we just lost a race. All we've got to do is focus in tomorrow. Nothing exists beyond tomorrow. And we learn from what we've just done on the racetrack. No question about it. We absorb every bit of data, every home, home truth within the organization. But we just focus in on tomorrow. And 
the concept of failure, it was just part of the learning experience, part of the stepping stone, part of the journey. So it's really interesting in terms of the, the from my perspective, how I reduce the impact of failure in the way I saw high performance. That's the point. As you said, you're up against it. And the odds are you're going to lose, right? When, when the Americans are that far ahead, they're yeah. going to destroy you and they're going to have they're going to have joy in it. And signs are taken it's been chained down the street and the congratulations to the Yanks, etc. Dennis Connor, Dennis Connor's entourage, they had they had uh, tents set up with champagne and ice at three one. Because Dennis and the boys only had to go out and win one more race. That's right. You had your chat with your team. You said, okay, it's just another day. We're going to focus tomorrow. Let's just focus purely on that day. But personally, when you walked back onto that yacht, did the pressure go up that extra level? No. Ah, really? Yeah. No. That's something else. Isn't it? Mm. So why? One, I loved what I was doing. I was having fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you think, oh, God, this guy's crazy. And my wife would say, yes, yeah. she would agree with that. It is a bit warped in some regards, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, the whole, correct, you know, multi-million dollar program, okay? The skipper makes the final split-second decisions. It's like a fighter pilot. Um, yeah, it's a bit warped. I, I don't deny that at all. But I was having fun. Yeah. Okay, in an extreme manner, you know, living on the edge of life, the smell of gunpowder, as they say, you know, you wouldn't be dead for quids. Was the pressure increased? No. Was the consequences of winning or losing increased? Absolutely. But it was not part of my world. The part of the world was, would you believe, flying with Jonathan Livingston? <laughs> no, I do believe you on that now. <laughs> Is that right? I know, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> How do we make this boat? How do we find perfection with what we're doing? You're still thinking that when you're walking under the boat under all that pressure of the world watching you that day? Yeah, to the exclusion of the rest of the world. I saw no crowds. My team that was there, okay? We down to the dock, the boat would leave plus or minus, nine o'clock plus or minus 30 seconds. Men at work, the music would blare out, boxing kangaroo flag would break open and we're off the dock. To the exclusion of the rest of the world. We got rid of all television sets, got rid of all newspapers. We didn't know, we did not want to know what was happening in the rest of the world. Okay. Was the pressure increased? No. So therefore, in that environment, you've got a pretty good chance of performing into this flow zone that we talk about. And that was the case. The final race, I remember, perhaps had to make a 2,000 decisions in a two and a half hour race. Right. Long projects, these things. Yeah. One race, two and a half hours, for God's sake. 2,000 decisions. You know what? It was slow motion. The tactics came at me in slow motion. The wind shifts on the water, the trimming of the sails, my communication. Now, it's not slow motion in the real world, but it was, it was definitely Bradman or, or uh, Babe Ruth hitting that ball, okay, where I was in control of my environment. The final second last leg of that uh, race, uh, Chink Longley, John Longley reminded me a few years back what I said when we're, we're 57 seconds behind, we could hardly read the numbers of the bastards up front, <laughs> uh, that far in front. <laughs> you talk about glass half full. <laughs> so, so apparently what I'm sure I Jonathan said, wasn't towing you blokes along. Well, he was up there. He was up above us, that's for sure. You know, we had 20 tons of boat. We had to maneuver around the track, wow. down the track. Yeah. So Chick reminded me, I, apparently I would, you know, we're way back, we're a long way back, but it, we're still in the race, for God's sake. And, uh, and anything had happened. That's the thing, you know, wind and water, wind shifts, all that stuff. But uh, apparently I, I said something along the words of, we've got to keep concentrating, guys, otherwise we may lose this race. <laughs> and we're 57 seconds behind. Oh, we could hardly read their numbers so, so far in front. We've got to keep concentrating, otherwise we may lose this race. Now, that's really, that's like inverted yeah. overview of how, how the real world was. Most people think, oh, God, throw the towel in, boys, and go home before you get rushed, you know, caught in the stampede. So we then, looking back on it, was as, as close to perfection as we'd ever achieved, in my opinion, in saying that second last leg of the course where we came from 57 seconds behind 
to be 15 seconds in front of the bottom mark or whatever it was. The float drop going around the bottom mark, Kenny Judge, is now an investment banker in Monaco, never sailed a day since that last race, had climbed his Everest. Very interesting group of people we had on that boat, okay? What he did in that float drop was just beautiful, perfection, under extreme pressure. It Possibly it was about 20 seconds after we first crossed the American boat when we were then in the lead that that Kenny realised that we're in front. His, his concentration on the spinnaker trim was so extreme. He had no vision other than the sail trim. And again, no words were being said. Just exactly what was required, where the wind was coming from and low keyed. It was like a SWAT team within a highly developed operation. And looking at the velocity made good, the VMG numbers, as close to perfection for that boat than we probably ever sailed. Under you have to say extreme pressure, mm. but the pressure, interesting enough, was, was not there. It was just the concentration, and it was this endeavour to to achieve perfection. So, Greg, something very special to be involved with with that group of people. That's for sure. Is that the thrill of it all, John? Yeah, the people that you associate with, the crowd that you hang out with. Yeah, that's right. No question. And developing an organisation, a team, whatever to the point where you have this total trust, where you, 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 you know, people talk about having each other's back. Yeah. That's true. You know, we get together every five years, you know, the Australia two team, and we don't talk about, we don't talk about the America's cup win with You know, there's no arrogance within the organization, but I can tell you there's this incredible feeling of serenity and contentment within that group of very, very select group of people. You know, it's, it's just beautiful stuff. I walk away from those, you know, re reunions, you think, how cool is that? You know, those very blood brothers, as people say. It's true too. You've done many speeches to companies? I've done quite a few over the years. Yeah, I don't, I say no to a lot of stuff, because uh, but I enjoy meeting and, um, and talking and learning from interesting people as part of presentations, yeah. Well, the question I'm going to ask you, when you're up there and then afterwards you go and meet the you know, those, those individuals in that company. Or the and, briefings beforehand, I yeah. enjoy very much, you know. Do you think it's actually realistic to see companies really create that high-performance culture? Does it get anywhere near that camaraderie, that special experience, that 20 years later catching up with those cold beers and not talking about the cup and how's the family and everything else? It's rare. Hmm. Have you seen it anywhere? Occasionally, Yes. Yes, it, you know, startups, yeah, until exactly. they get to a certain size, those people move on, but they come back and they think, hey, you know, what we created, how good was that? But it's rare. Big organisations, very rare. Within the banks, for example, yeah. you know, when you employ 25, 35,000 people, it's really hard to, you know, get that sort of uh, vision and that culture driven all of, and that purpose driven from the top down to the rank and file. But it's possible. Yeah, okay. So I, I, I can care, particularly around startups, and we're all in it together, aren't we? Yes. Okay. So for those well, coming out of COVID and where we are in Australia, and those people who have got the courage to go and start up a new business, what do you say about them, how to go about their, how do they focus on the journey? Well, again, it's, it's defining the purpose. It's defining the vision. And visions have to be exciting. Really, very, very important. Amazon, you know, really interesting organization, for goodness sake. Yeah. Amazing what they've achieved. Yep. Same as Google. When they, you know, they, they started selling widgets and gadgets online and then they spun out cloud services, AWS, I guess. And uh, they see life as a series of experiments, okay, where they're constantly moving into other areas and testing the market. So if they get three or four out of 10 right, then they have a new division. That's how Amazon Web Services developed, you know, because they knew a lot about data when they were tracking their, you know, the various people buying their bits and pieces, and they figured maybe there's a market for this. Any of these visions or purposes for these new types of offshoots of, of uh, you know, this organization has to be exciting. If it's not exciting, then they won't do it because without an exciting purpose or an exciting vision, people won't get excited pretty basic stuff it's pretty 101 stuff when you think about it yep. okay yeah 
so they do basically a press release, a one-page press release, and it's well, you know, it's well documented now. The press release is what this company or what this this organisation will have achieved into the future, but they're writing it for now. And if that's not exciting for the hierarchy, then they won't give the go-ahead. Pretty basic human trait. So for an organisation, in my opinion, to be successful, you've got to have an exciting, you've got to have an exciting vision. Okay. And then it's a matter of building an organization around that where you have this, this basic, the glue, you know, starting from this thing called trust. And that comes from the leadership, having people running the show who have integrity and honesty, transparency, having fun. How you scale that to a bigger organization, then that's part of the challenge into the future. There's no question. However, it's possible. You know, you see major, major changes when they get the right CEO in place yep. compared to previous CEOs. So there's no question. Transformation. Things are happening all the time. A lot of it is the empowerment of people, in my opinion, and it's the vulnerability of the leaders showing that they're vulnerable and they need help. And as a result, you have people combining together instead of just being mission control. What did Victor teach you about the journey? Kovalenko, my God. Plenty. And I still learn from Victor. So who is this bloke? He came from the Ukraine. He comes from the Russian school of thinking. He graduated uh, from uh, you know, within the uh, Russian sports academies. And he now is the most successful sailing, Olympic sailing coach the world has ever seen. Right. He's now the Australian Olympic coach for Australia. He came to Australia in 1997, coming from the Ukraine and coming from with the world of Russia. Beautiful man heavy accent, whatever. He's now, he and his wife and children are now naturalized, proud Australians, a beautiful man. I met Victor in the 2000 Olympics and uh, I was a mentor for the team with Herb Elliott and Dawn Fraser. It, what an honor to be involved. So I, so we, we stayed at the, in the, at Homebush at the Olympic team uh, with the Australian team in, in the 2000, September 2000. It's just fantastic. So I was assigned to some track and field, to rowing, equestrian, uh, soccer, sailing, of course. And I met Kovalenko. He was then the coach of the men's and women's 470 Olympic team. Mm -hmm. So just before the Olympics on Sydney Harbour, I introduced myself and he said, yes, John, I, I know all about your America's Cup, whatever, beautiful stuff. <laughs> and uh, I said, Victor, tell me about your philosophy. I see, he said, what do you mean? I said, how do you go about, because he'd already been coaching from the Ukraine Olympic gold medalists as well in the world of sailing. So tell me the philosophy. He says, within th I have three years normally, John. Normally, actually, normally I have four years, but with all the red tape, it was compressed down to three years. So I came in 1997. Year one is to excite their imaginations, excite his students, his, his athletes' imaginations, not only about the concept of boat speed, higher, further, and faster, right. exciting their imaginations, but exciting them as human beings about how the world is, for them to become interested and interesting, okay, to be inquisitive, to be curious. This is this the great man, year one, to excite his young people's imaginations. Year two it is to go onto the world stage, to compete in the world championships, the US national championships, the European championships, and so on. Year three, which was the year of the Olympics, this is the 2000 Olympics, he says, John, it is very simple. It is to dominate the world. Wow. So you don't reckon that young people, when they hear that, thinking, how do I get a piece of this? How do I get on this bus? Yeah. So Victor's vision is very simple. Domination. <laughs> There's no confusion. If you want to be part of Victor Kovalenko's Olympic program, it is world domination. He doesn't recoil from that. World domination. That's exciting, particularly for young people. It's only for anyone, isn't it? Because when you think about, as you go about to high performance, to become a high performer, you're not going to follow a conventional route, are you? No. Okay. So how do corporates get to high performance when we've got so much, you know, PC uh, governance, etc.? We're so trying to noise. we're trying to reach we're trying to get to Nirvana, yet we get we do everything via convention. Well, you know, Google, Amazon. Mm -hmm. They're doing this stuff, you know, in their own right. What they're doing is amazing, and okay. they're going from strength to strength. There's X factors associated with some of these companies, okay? 
how does a big company get there? It comes from leadership. And those leaders inspire people throughout the organization. Those people are champions of the cause. And that's really important. You're not just talking about your leadership team. You're talking about having the ability to walk and talk with people throughout your organization. If you've got 30,000 people, to be on the deck, on the, on the deck of, your, of your organization and be talking to the rank and file as well, who in turn become champions of the cause. The ability to walk and talk around the organization, to have that ability, that communication ability. It's like the Bob Hawke, how he inspired people. You know, he went from head of the ACTU to encapsulating big business in this country. Yeah. The Accord, yeah. he and the Keating team, unbelievable, flow to the dollar. Yeah. You talk about balls. Yeah. Deregulated the financial system just after we, as it turns out, won their cup in 83. Had just gone through bushfires and, and droughts. His ability to communicate and to inspire people. I remember Raz and I were up at um, Government House after we won and Hawke was there and a whole bunch of people. In fact, would you believe Princess Diana and Charles, come to think of it? <laughs> yeah, you know. And, uh, and so here's Bob. We got up a group of us around Bob, and Bob's talking about the global stage and his ability to capture every, you know, there's about six of us all basically around a circle of Bob Hawke, the then Prime Minister of Australia. And Diana and Charles were sitting down, you know, talking, I don't know what, but it doesn't matter. And inspirational, Greg, what this man was about. His ability within 30 seconds to capture people's imagination on where he thought this country, Australia, the proud country was going. That's communication. That's leadership. That's part of the, you know, promoting the vision that he, how he saw this country. That's all part and parcel. And that person's ability, they say that it takes one person in a thousand to create a revolution, a revolution of thought. Okay. okay. Yeah. And that person, so what are the characteristics of leadership of that person? Communication, honesty, integrity. People can figure that out real fast and enthusiastic vision of where this organization, people want that. People want to get, have a reason to get up out of bed to do extraordinary things, either for themselves or for the organization. We see that in some of these companies, like in my opinion, like Amazon and Google and others. Are we a winning country, John? Absolutely we are. We actually, we don't talk about it enough. Barely hear about it. Yeah, 20, how many, 27 million people? What we've done is extraordinary. We're self-effacing. It's a beautiful part of being an Australian as well. A beautiful part. In America, we'd be, again, high-fiving and, you know, beating our chest and how good is this? You know, the, nothing's impossible, which I think I applaud. I think it's wonderful. But we don't applaud success enough. You know what? The title of my biography was ultimately called Born to Win. Yep. And initially, it was going to be called To Take You Home. And the publishers in New York, Bantam, said, it's not a pick-me-up title. It means nothing. It actually meant a lot to me. It came out of Jonathan Livingston Seagull, to take you home. Yep. Okay. And the publisher said, well, what's different about this bloke? Well, as it turns out, my great-grandfather was an engineer for two of Sir Thomas Limpton's America's Cup building programs in Southampton in England. So they think, well, obviously the kid, you know, he's got this in his blood, born to win, to win the, the bloody America's Cup. Okay. So that was where the title came from. It took me a long time to accept that I'd, I'd allow that to happen. The concept of calling a book Born to Win in Australia, the flack that I was going to get in terms of putting myself out to say, yeah, I was in there to give this a great shot. And as it turns out, we, you know, we're part of the country's history. But I felt at the time it was an opportunity to legitimize the concept of winning. Yeah. If I couldn't do it, just coming out of the America's Cup, very few people could, to actually put my head above the parapet to say, you know, winning is fine and we accept it. This is counter to the tall poppy syndrome. And I don't think, my opinion is we don't applaud, it's not part of our psyche. It's a beautiful thing in terms of being, you know, the, the way we are, the way we react to situations, but it holds us back in many ways. What this country has done and is doing is amazing. I back young people all the time. You yeah. know, we go, we're coming out of COVID, yeah. tough financial environment. People say, my God, you know, our economic environment, how are we going to do? I think we're going to do fine. We're going to do great. People's worlds will change. 
uh, the new startups opportunities that young people with no fear will be generating, new business models that we just don't even know about at the moment yeah. will be coming out of the woodwork. And in my opinion, now that we're connected to the world via this thing called the internet, we don't have to get on a plane all the time. We are part of the world. We are now in a high level of education and, in my opinion, curiosity and giving it a go, mate. They're all great ingredients for this country to do extremely well into the future, What's, as well as digging stuff out of the ground, which we're pretty good at. In all your experience, John, a simple question for you. What's tough to you? What makes someone tough? I think toughness is about not giving up. Okay. I see it quite clearly. Learning. I see failure as about a learning process. You know, the Americans talk about failing fast. Mm. It's a yeah. beautiful concept. Yeah. Just do it. If you fail, you fail, learn from it, create and succeed. Uh, toughness, I think, is about not giving up. It's the Winston Churchill thing. Never, ever give up. What about rowing, John? You've had a bit experience there. Tough. No question. So the best way I could perhaps um, describe my interaction with the sport of rowing, I, I it, part of the team that uh, for America's Cup effort, I rang up the president of Rowing Australia way back then, mm -hmm. uh, and I said, I, I want to talk to the, your best, the best rowing combatant in this country uh, for the America's Cup. We want to learn. We Perhaps this person should be sailing on the boat. He sent me to a guy called Brian Richardson, who then became, as he sailed on the boat, we called him Splash because he fell off the boat one time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Splash. He went on to become the Olympic head coach for Canada and then back to Australia. Beautiful stuff. At any rate, these rowers are pretty interesting. They're tough people. They're, they're training regime. I had the awesome foursome in our lounge room in our, in our home leading into the 95, our 95 America's Cup project. That's the boat that broke up and sank in 90 seconds. You talk about failure. So I'm, I, I'm part of history. I'm the first man to win the America's Cup and the first man to sink an America's Cup boat. So there you go. It's my claim to fame. Anyway, we had the awesome foursome in the, in, the, in the front lounge, and they were keen to join the 95 America's Cup challenge. And they'd, their Olympic gold medals coming out of 92 out of Barcelona. And uh, 96, of course, was the Atlanta Olympics. And um, they, they said, do you have a key? And I said, no, in my opinion, stick with what you've got. And they went on and they competed in Atlanta. They're telling me of the situation where they were being beaten by other countries, including the Americans and Germans in the, in the four, in their world championships leading into the Atlanta Olympics. And primarily it was about endeavoring to take their rowing to a new level of performance. The world had caught up to them, okay? And they're actually just one of the mob. Right. Whereas before they dominated leading into the 92 Olympics in Barcelona. And that no matter how hard they tried, they were not getting an increase in performance. If anything, the harder they tried, the slower they became. And they then worked through the concept of they've got to relax. You know, we're getting into the flow zone world that I've talked about. And how do you relax when you're about to die through exhaustion? So they went through this mental game of, when they moved into the world of the red zone, where there's not enough blood coming from your heart into your brain, and you're starting to lose sight, they call it the red zone. This is what these people do, okay, in, a, in competition. And as they're hitting the red zone, and you've got so many seconds before you go unconscious, they are then in the business of reducing the pressure on the, on the oars. They were releasing their grips on the oars. Because what they, were, if they concluded they were doing is as they were getting tired, more tired, more tired, they were gripping harder and harder. So they went through the mental process, the gyration of, of relaxing their grip on their oars as they were approaching the so-called red zone where you're basically, you're gone. Lactic acid almost certainly would be all part of that discussion at that stage. And when they relaxed, they took their rowing to a new level. They went on to win the Olympic gold medal in 96 Atlanta. These people are tough. Yeah. So we needed that type of knowledge base and toughness within our Australia 2 team. The Kiwis have done it with their other America's Cup projects since then. Yeah. Some of their world champions and skulls and so on, they've raced on those America's Cup boats. 
So there are all these people adding different knowledge bases and, and profiles to the organization, learning from everyone. And Kiwis change their teams regularly, don't they? One thing that they concluded coming out of the America's Cup that they won in Bermuda, which is three years ago, is that half of their technical team had to be new to the world of the America's Cup if they were to take it to a new level. Wow. Why? Because if you have people saying, this is how we've always done it in the past, uh, they'll be overrun by the competition. So 50% of the design team, apparently going into their design studios is like going in to a high school reunion. Everyone's so young, just graduates out of Auckland University or Wellington or from around the world. You know, the Kiwi is very, very inventive. For three and a half million people, the All Blacks, what they've achieved, you know, their whole mission the world, their ability, the, you know, the Jonathan Livingston Seagull world, their ability within the world of America's Cup. It's really wonderful case studies. But half the team has to be new. The other part is they still take their lunches to work so no one can complain about the food. <laughs> How good is that? Terrific. You know, yeah. Well, now, why? Because they ran out of money, but the previous America's Cup, they didn't have enough money for the food, so everyone had to contribute. Is that right? And they've taken that culture on. Yeah. I love it. When you're chair of Australian Swimming, I got the impression you started building a relationship with Australian Special Forces. Is, is that right? Yes. What did you learn during, well, during this period of time? Lots. Lots about culture of trust. If we talk about trust, these people, this is all about trust. Now we're talking about life and death. We're not talking about, you know, a sporting event, Olympics or America's Cup. That's all kid stuff compared to what these people are, you know, involved with. And it's all about for their mates. You know, there's no question. It's just beautiful stuff. You talk about having your having each other's back. It's also this whole issue of controlling yourself, uh, this down-regulating, as I talked before, getting into the flow zone. Yep. Okay, monitoring and and uh, moving from a very very high intense area to a level where each of these combatants have a different level of of uh, you might say vital statistics where they are calm. This word calmness is key. We talk about race to calmness. They go from a high level intensive area. It, this is in training. They take their heart rate down. They take their um, you know all the various ingredients down to a level where they're ready to perform in a super high performance environment. We learned that from the special forces and, the, and their knowledge around the, uh, the science behind it and understanding therefore the mental functions and, and uh, issues associated with making the right decisions at the right time. And again, this is a journey. They've also learned from us because we, we, they see us as a very interesting case study of high performance. So when you surmise high performance, John, as we come to a conclusion, I guess it goes back to Ron Barassi, doesn't it? We might, we've been born with certain traits, but a lot of it's down to upstairs. I remember Ron telling me, um, I'd ask him about the grand finals again, Collingwood. You know, he hates Collingwood. I'm a Collingwood supporter, so we have a lot of fun. It's wonderful stuff. And he said, you know, the grand final, he went out and his, he his legs were heavy. Okay. He'd already played the match the night before and that morning, and he was buggered that he played the game in his mind. Yeah, right. Okay. And he was, and he was, as a result, physically tired, running out onto the MCG with a hundred thousand people barracking. You know, now this is the world of special forces, special ops, being able to go without sleep, perform at high level. It's the world of of, of the Olympic Games. It's the world of America's Cup. It's the world of people performing when it really counts, anywhere at any time, at your own volition around the world, and. So way back when his legs were heavy, that's that was a mind thing. It had nothing to do with his physical preparation. It's just a you know, it's a beautiful, clear example of of um, not being prepared mentally for when it really counted. What's your final message, John, to all those aspiring entrepreneurs, all those young people coming through? Why would I entertain the idea of going through the hell and back like you've done? Uh, I think uh, I wouldn't. When I, you know, the concept of me encouraging my kids and grandkids to do what I've done, I'm not sure that's a good thing to do, <laughs> to be honest, you know, in terms of the sacrifice. But I also look at our kids and they're all doing great. Um, you know, we're really proud of what they're doing and they don't have much fear of failure, which is a wonderful thing. Now, look, my, my recommendation to young people is 
find your passion in life. Hopefully, you can make money out of it. That's you know that's a responsible aspect because you end up you know with not in normal circumstances with a family and 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 uh, dependence and so on. But find the passion and then get on with it um, and uh, and have fun doing it and stay curious. Steve Jobs, what beautiful quotes, say. Eh? Stay curious, stay brave, whatever he said. Beautiful stuff. John, uh, once again, thank you very much for giving us your time. As usual, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. My great pleasure. You've been listening to No Limitations.